Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, Angola is on the eve of the most competitive election in its history. UNITA, the opposition party that poses the most serious challenge to the ruling MPLA, calls on voters to stay put in polling stations to keep an eye out for irregularities. Also, Kenyans forced off their land by British settlers during colonial rule take the United Kingdom to the European Court of Human Rights. The descendants of those evicted from Kenya's Rift Valley say the UK has been deliberately ignoring victims' plight. And dinosaurs around Guinea had a pretty bad day 66 million years ago. Scientists have recently discovered a crater off the country's coast, which they think was caused by an asteroid causing substantial but not total devastation. We hear from one of the scientists on the team. But first, on Wednesday, Angola heads into parliamentary elections that will decide the country's next president. The opposition UNITA poses a substantial challenge to the ruling MPLA of President João Lourenço, who's running for a second term. 14 million voters are expected to cast their ballot. Opposition voices and several civil society groups have called on the electorate to stay put at polling stations to keep an eye on the process and spot any irregularities. Clément Bonero tells us more. For Angola's opposition, as well as several civil society groups, the risk of electoral fraud is high. And like in previous elections, results will be compiled at the national level by the National Electoral Commission, the CNE. This means that there will be no compilation at the municipal and provincial level. Another cause for concern for activists is the presence of 2 million dead people registered as voters on the electoral roll. To promote a more transparent process, Mude, a local NGO, has set up its own platform to compile and publish results in real time. Our database will draw on data sent by people going from polling station to polling station all over the country, taking photographs, which I hope will be clear, of the vote count at each polling station. And these will then be compiled centrally and published on a platform which will be available as soon as the first results start coming in on our website, jikuangola.org. Meanwhile, UNITA, Angola's main opposition party, has called on voters to remain near polling stations after they cast their ballots to monitor the election process. The Electoral Commission, however, insists that this will not be necessary. The laws governing the electoral process in Angola are sufficiently robust in terms of safeguards to ensure that the electoral process is free from such suspicions. This includes the existence of voters' lists, as well as the presence of representatives of the different parties in the political stations, who are in fact monitoring agents for the political parties. According to Angola's Electoral Commission, 1,300 national and international observers will be deployed across the country. Polling stations will be open from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. local time. Clément Bonnero there for us. Now, Kenyans forced off their land by Britons during colonial rule have turned to the European Court of Human Rights, accusing the UK government of deliberately ignoring the harm caused to their victims and their descendants. In the early 20th century, the Kipsigis and the Talai were evicted from their homes in the Rift Valley, a fertile area that is now a major tea-growing region. Lawyers say that the indigenous communities were subjected to rape, murder and arson. Vivian Wandera is in Nairobi. She joins us now. Vivian, so... Tell us a bit more about what exactly happened to the Kipsi guys and Talai under colonialism. Well, Georgia, between the years of 1895 and 1963, when Kenyans uh, gained independence, uh, the British colonial, uh, the British colonialists were in Kenya, and the people of Talai and Kipsi were one of the main uh, people who suffered most during this era because they were forcefully evicted from their homes being forced to stay in other places. They were taken to concentration camps and most of them endured severe mistreatment and, and death treatment. Now, this lawsuit is coming at a time when people have been calling for justice and calling for the UK government to uh, repatriate people for the injustices they committed in Kenya during the colonial times. And the outgoing governor of Kirichon County has been playing a big role in ensuring that his people get justice. However, the UK government has been ignoring this uh, request and been ignoring 
the violations that the people that they committed against these people. So now they are going to the European Court of Human Rights, demanding that the United Kingdom must recognize the injustices they committed against them. And their main concern is that they are not benefiting from any of the economic benefits that these tea companies that include Unilever, Williamson Teas, Finlay's and Lipton are benefiting from, from these lands that initially belong to them. Um, Vivian, so why are the victims now turning to the European Court of Human Rights for redress of uh, damages committed under British colonialism in Kenya? Well, they are saying that they have made many uh, attempts to reach to the UK government and uh, have a talk to the, with the UK government, but their requests have always been denied. And now they are saying that this is against the European Convention of Human Rights, which the United Kingdom is a member of, and are calling for the European Court of Human Rights to intervene and actually get them audience with the UK government. According to their lawyers, they say that in May of this year, they sent a letter to the UK Foreign Secretary requesting for them to meet either the victims or their representatives, but their request was also denied and ignored. And they're saying that it's about time that the UK actually admits and takes responsibility for the things that they actually did for them because they are suffering the consequences of the colonial rule and the mistreatment they endured during the colonial times up to date. Thank you very much. Vivian Wendera there for us in Nairobi. Uh, look now at some news in brief. Nigeria has banned the use of foreign models and voiceover artists for ads targeting nationals. The new policy is aimed at encouraging economic growth by promoting local content, culture and talent. The changes will take effect from the 1st of October. And though ongoing campaigns will be able to continue, the country's Advertising Regulatory Council has already said that future applications will have to conform to the new conditions. Google Wallets launched in South Africa to take advantage of the huge shift to digital transactions of the continent's top economies. Now, that was sped up by the pandemic as more customers chose to use contactless payment via their smart devices. From Tuesday, cardholders from several South Africa's, some of several of South Africa's top banks will be able to add their cards to Google Wallet and tap to pay. Greenpeace Africa is among several environmental organizations that claim to be facing threats because of their objections to the Congolese government's plan to auction off oil and gas blocks, some of which are in peat bogs. Activists had denounced the plan as being potentially devastating for biodiversity. Some now say that they've since received death threats and anonymous phone calls. The government launched a call for tenders for the 30 blocks at the end of July and promised to ensure that environmental standards would be respected. Now, Abidjan in Ivory Coast was once home to what people in the nearby communities like to call the Pearl of Lagoons. Now, locals called Ebri a dump. Plastic pollution and unbridled development have devastated the natural treasure. It's one of the largest expanses of brackish water on the continent, stretching far into the countryside west of Abidjan, all the way to the Azagni National Park. Carolyn Lamboli tells us more. To mangroves teeming with fish and wildlife, the shores of the Ibrier Lagoon near Abidjan are now littered with urban and industrial waste from the big city, a sorry sight that betrays the levels of pollution under the water's surface. Since 2007 and 2008, everything is spoiled. You see all these heaps of garbage that come here directly. That's what ruined the shore of Biago. Those who knew Biago back in the day and who see it now, they say it's a dump. Paul Abbé is the chief of Biago, a village that sits on the lagoon. He says there are no more fish and that the village's 3,000 residents could be forced to leave, seeking greener pastures. Whatever aquatic life is left is contaminated. The lagoon has sectors that are... Parts of the lagoon are polluted to the point that we speak of a dead bay. This means that the life of the species is no longer what it should be. Some sectors of the lagoon have a pollution rate of 9 out of 10. He says plastic is the biggest source of pollution. Recycling in Ivory Coast is still in its infancy. Just 3% of the 460,000 tons of plastic that are produced each year are recycled. But plastic is not the only culprit. We have to live with nuisances. 
such as pestilential smells because of sand extraction in the lagoon, which digs into pockets of silt and causes these nauseating smells. Some residents have joined forces to try and bring change, and several initiatives are brewing to collect all the rubbish. Well, some 66 million years ago, dinosaurs were wiped out by a massive asteroid that fell in the Gulf of Mexico. Scientists have recently discovered another crater off the coast of Guinea, which they think was caused by a smaller asteroid falling at around the same time. While it was not as impactful as the asteroid that definitively killed off the dinosaurs, its regional impact would have been huge. Sam Babpi spoke to one of the researchers involved to get a better sense of this prehistoric devastation. Scientists believe this crater, discovered off the coast of Guinea, was likely caused by a 400-metre-wide asteroid hurtling towards Earth at 12 miles per second. Its impact would have been so forceful that it would have released 100 times more energy than the most powerful nuclear weapon ever dropped. I spoke to one of the researchers behind the discovery and asked her what the scene would have looked like for a dinosaur observing from the coast of West Africa. If you imagine you weren't incinerated, blown off into East Africa, or um, you know, shaken to death by an earthquake, uh, you will see the sea recede. The beach will stretch on forever. And the next thing you're going to see is a 800 meter to a kilometer high wall of water coming back at you. It's gonna be a horrible day. Asteroids still pose a threat to life on Earth, but probably not in our lifetime. The most dangerous one we know about is called the Benno asteroid, and it's thought to be about the same size as the one which caused this newly discovered crater. Scientists say there's a 1 in 1,750 chance that the Benno asteroid collides with Earth in the next few hundred years. Phew. Thanks, Sam, for uh, easing our concerns at the end there. That is, though, all we have time for for Eye on Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care. They observe. They contact us. They report, film, photograph. They are the voice of the voiceless your eyes in the far-flung reaches of the world. The Observers, a network of 5,000 committed citizens working with France 24. One of our observers in Côte d'Ivoire, Gaspar. Amateur footage and testimonials checked by our journalists and broadcast weekly on The Observers on France 24 and observers.france24.com.